Hello and welcome to MK's review medical series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. And this is indeed X-Ray Week. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment, share the link. Tell a friend to tell a friend that it's X-Ray Week. Grab your piece of paper and your pen and let's go. In the previous lectures, we looked at the systematic approach of the chest X-Ray interpretations. But prior to that, we looked at the technical qualities of a good X-Ray. If you haven't yet watched part one of those videos, please go and check out the playlist and watch that video before you can continue to watching this second video. And the previous video was an introduction on the systematic approach. We went halfway with that lecture. If you haven't understood that, this lecture is going to be like I'm speaking in tongues. So please check that video out as well. You should watch these videos in systematic order for you to be able to follow them. And then we'll look at normal chest x-ray anatomy in a nutshell. Then later on, we're going to be looking at abnormal chest x-ray patterns. And then after that, then we'll go in depth with each of the segments. So remember, just to remind you of and things that we have covered, uh, before you actually read the x-ray, you should have ensured that this x-ray has good technical qualities and some preliminaries have already been ticked. So the demographics of the x-ray, the marker that's present on the x-ray, that if the patient is well-centered, if there's no rotation, all, all these things I did talk about in the first lecture, and then the degree of inspiration, you check that the scapulae are not in the lung fields, and of course that there is some adequate penetration. Then when we're reading the chest x-ray, we use the ABC approach as we already alluded to in the previous Video A for airway, B for bones, C for cardiac shadow and mediastinum, D for diaphragm, all four of which we covered in the previous lecture. If you haven't yet watched that video, head over there right now before you continue with this video. Then E for effusions and pleura, F for lung fields, G for gastric bubble and eventually H for the hilum. We shall cover the remaining four topics. I won't go into so much details about the lung fields because I want to reserve that for the next review lecture video when we'll now be able to distinguish patterns that are affecting the alveoli of the lungs versus patterns that are affecting the interstitium of the lungs. So here's a picture of a normal x-ray. Remember, you should look at your technicalities of the x-ray, the demographics, of course, which are not going to be depicted here for sake of uh, privacy of the patient, uh, the marker that is present, you ensure that this x-ray is well centered. So it means that the, the medial ends of the clavicle to the spinous processes must have equal distance on both sides. You should be able to visualize the outline of the thoracic vertebra, even the vertebra behind the heart to signify that this x-ray is well exposed. You should be able to count 9 to 10 posterior ribs, 5 to 6 with the 7th rib piercing the diaphragm when you're talking about the anterior ribs. The costal phrenic angles should be visualized. The apices of the lungs should be visualized. And of course, um, the scapulae shouldn't be in the lung fields. That's when we now go on to our ABC approach where we'll look at the airway, we'll look at each of the bones on the x-ray, we'll look, we looked at some of the pathologies that are present on the bones like fractures, scoliosis, kyphosis, rib sclerosis, even osteolytic lesions, as well as we looked at other bone pathologies such as rib notching. Then we went on to look at the cardiac shadow where we looked at enlargement of different chambers of the heart. We looked at the mediastinum, but we shall go into details of those in each and every individual separate lecture. We then went on to look at effusions and the pleura, or rather prior to that, we looked at the diaphragm, rather, Effusions and pleura is going to be in this lecture video. I don't know why I'm jumping the gun. So diaphragm and pleura, we looked at um, the right diaphragm, the anatomy of the left diaphragm, which diaphragm is much higher than the other. And then in this review lecture video, we shall continue and look at effusions and pleura. So we're now at E. We've covered airway, we've covered bones, we've covered, circul we've covered cardiac shadow, not circulation. Sorry, I had trauma in my mind. And we have covered the diaphragm. Now we're coming to the effusion and the pleura. So remember that the lungs are going to be covered by a membrane. The membrane that is adherent to the lung is known as the visceral membrane. The membrane that is adherent to the thoracic cavity is known as the parietal membrane. In between these, you have your pleural fluid and in the pleural space, which is a potential space where you could have accumulation of air, you could have accumulation of fluid. So remember that on a normal 
posterior anterior chest x-ray, the pleura is invisible. You're not able to see it. It only becomes visible or present if it has certain pathologies, like for example, if there's a pleural plaque or a pleural thickening, if there's any loculations that are present in this space, if there are any calcifications, or if indeed there is air in the pleural space, which we refer to as a pneumothorax. So you should be able to check for the coastal phrenic angles for any blunting. I will show you where the coastal phrenic angles are if you do not already know that. So you should check the right and the left on the PA view as well as the posterior on the lateral view. They become very sensitive, especially when picking up pleural effusions. So you should also identify the major fissures. Remember that the right lung is going to be divided into three lobes by two fissures, a horizontal fissure and an oblique fissure. The left lung is going to be divided by one main fissure, which is pretty much the oblique fissure. The only fissure that you can see on a posterior anterior X-ray is, of course, your horizontal fissure, which is not seen in almost all the cases. The oblique fissures, you can't really see them on the posterior anterior, just X-ray. So here are the coastal phrenic angles. As we can see here, they are supposed to be acute, so they should be present. You have also this here as a posterior coastal phrenic angle that you should check for. And sometimes there may be obliteration of this angle. For example, if there's fluid that is accumulating within the space and of course you have the diaphragm the right diaphragm which is much higher due to the presence of the liver the left diaphragm which is lower here and here they're almost superimposed on each other so we'll begin with talking about a pneumothorax so remember that a pneumothorax is just pretty much air that is present in the pleural space so the size of the pneumothorax is pretty much going to be based on the thickness of the rim of air that is surrounding the lung especially at the level of the hilum on the posterior anterior film. So if the size is less than 2 centimeters, you refer to that as a small pneumothorax. If the size is greater than 2 centimeters, you refer to that as a large pneumothorax. And so some causes of pneumothoraces, which is the plural of pneumothorax, primary causes, it could be idiopathic, meaning it just happens spontaneously. We do not really know what may be causing this. Or it may be secondary to something such as some iatrogenic causes like thoracosynthesis, uh, lung biopsies, even central line placements. You could have some chronic obstructive pulmonary disorders. You could have cystic fibrosis, even pneumonia. So here is an example of a, of a pneumothorax. So on the left of your screen here, you have an inspiratory film. On the right of your screen here, you have an expiratory film. What you really need to note is that the lung volume hasn't changed significantly on the inspiratory film versus on the expiratory film. This is, of course, an x-ray of the same patient. Now, if you notice so well here, you could see that there is an edge or rather a line here that you can visualize. So this edge that you can visualize is the visceral pleura. And of course, it's the demarcation of the end of the lung. How do I know that there is no lung here? Remember that exterior to this or lateral to this you're not going to have any pulmonary markings to begin with this area will be much darker than it's supposed to be and that's how you know that these air that is present here so this is obviously a pneumothorax same thing is happening here in this expiratory film it makes it even much more obvious as we can actually trace the outline of the right lung over here so this is what a pneumothorax is going to look like this is a bit hard to see on this x-ray, but there are much more obvious x-rays. I use this x-ray to be specific so that you can train your eye to be able to pick it up even when it's very subtle. Here's another example, another subtle example of a pneumothorax. Here we, we can even see oh, with an inverse film that has been um, taken of the same patient. As we can see here, you can visualize the outline of this lung over here. And you can see this outline of this lung and external or peripheral to this, there are no lung markings here. And these, it's like this air that's trapped in this area here. It's, in the inverse film, it's going to appear much whiter than it's um, supposed to be. Another thing that you may see on a pneumothorax is referred to as a deep sulca sign, where it appears as if the diaphragm is extending much, much deep into the, uh, even like as if it's going into the abdominal cavity. You refer to this as a deep sulcus sign. 
And then moving on to pleural effusions, remember that when you are assessing for pleural effusions, which are fluids in the pleural space, you should ensure and check whether this pleural effusion is unilateral or bilateral. If it's a small effusion or it's a large effusion, if it's free flowing fluid or it's loculated, or if it's, uh, you should also link this pleural effusion to the associated findings that may suggest the etiology of this pleural effusion, because many things can result in pleural effusions. So... How we know that there is a pleural effusion, remember that we should be able to visualize the costal phrenic angle very well. So this angle here, which is known as the costal phrenic angle, we do not visualize it very well here on the left side. So we can see that there is blunting of the costal phrenic angle. There is this homogeneous opacity and there's another sign that you can actually notice of the right diaphragm, which is known as a silhouette sign, which I will talk about in the subsequent uh, review lecture video. So there is blunting of this uh, costophrenic angle, same thing here on the right side, planting of the costophrenic angle, a homogeneous uh, opacity in this area, though it's not really even in the lungs, but it's in the pleural space. So this is obviously a pleural effusion. Here is an example of a free-flowing uh, versus loculated, but to explain this, let me just show you a black screen so that I can draw something on it. So suppose you had a cup, yeah? Suppose you had a cup. I'm going to draw a very, very not so well drawn, but according to my eyes, this is some perfect art. A not so drawn, a well cup. So if we were to actually fill a cup with water, you would see that the water actually tracks along the edges or tracks along the sides of this cup. So it will form this level, which is referred to as a meniscus. So whenever water settles down or fluid settles down in its containing cavity, it will form a meniscus. The same thing is happening in this free fluid. So when water is now present or this fluid is present in the pleural space, it will form this meniscus. As we can see, we can't visualize the coxophrenic angle in this area and you have formed this meniscus that is present here. While as with the loculated, it's like this fluid is insisted or it is in a cavity. So it's surrounded by something. Most likely it could be that there is some fibrosis that is present in the pleural space and limiting the flow of this fluid. So you have this loculated effusion that is present over here. Here's an example of a free flowing as well as a loculated um, effusion in a lateral decubitus position. So you can see that the fluid is over here and flowing and distributing all over the zones of the lung then here it's um, still limited. Sometimes you may have a sub-pulmonic effusion. So this is just going to be accumulation of fluid between the lung base as well as the diaphragm, and it's not going to be tracking up the pleura. And so it's not going to be causing uh, blunting of the costophrenic angle. So what's going to hint you that this may be a sub-pulmonic uh, effusion are the following things. So the diaphragm is going to be um, peaked on in the lateral aspects than normal. So the lateral aspects will be much higher than they are supposed to be. The second thing is that the diaphragm is going to be appearing more horizontal than normal. So remember that the diaphragm has a dome shape, but it's now going to be like as if the diaphragm is flattening to some extent. Then on the left side, there's going to be abnormally large distance between the gastric bubble and the lung base. Then, of course, on the right side, there's going to be a high horizontal fissure. So the horizontal fissure will be pushed upwards. Then if you see these things, then you are most likely having or most likely dealing with a sub effusion. So as you can see here, we have this costophrenic angle, which can still be visualized here, but it's like as if this left, um, this left side or rather right side of the lung has been elevated much higher than it's supposed to be. As we can notice the distance between the right lung and um, the, the right lung diaphragm and the left lung diaphragm is actually very great, greater than 1.5 uh, centimeters. So as we can see also, there is like flattening of the diaphragm over here. Same thing is happening here where we, the diaphragm is a bit much more flat and the costophrenic angle can still be visualized, but the distance between this gastric bubble here or the, the air that's supposed to be here and the diaphragm is very high. And even here, the left diaphragm is higher than the right diaphragm, which of course should, shouldn't normally happen in a normal individual. So these are examples of sub effusions. So some causes of pleural effusions, remember that a pleural effusions could either be a transudate or an exudate. Now, we'll get back to physics. 
or rather physiology. So remember that whenever you have fluid that's in a containing cavity, this fluid is going to be exerting pressures on the wall. So let's say you have this blood vessel here, and we say that this is the blood vessel in the lung. So this blood vessel is going to be containing of blood, and this blood has molecules that are obviously going to be in constant motion and constantly going to be colliding with the walls of the blood vessel. So there is always a force that is generated to push this fluid out of the vascular space. Now, this force that is generated to push fluid out of the vascular space is referred to as your hydrostatic pressure. So I shall call this as HP. So this hydrostatic pressure tends to push fluid out of the vascular space. Now, remember that in the vascular space, you have proteins. You have uh, proteins like albumin, fibrinogen, uh, and other proteins uh, to mention, globulins. And in addition to this, you have red blood cells, which tend to draw water towards themselves. So this pressure in which this water or this fluid is drawn back into the um, vascular space, you refer to this as your osmotic pressure. And if you're talking about osmotic pressure that is offered by proteins, you refer to that as a colloidal pressure. So CP, not cerebral palsy, but colloidal pressure. So there's always a balance between the hydrostatic pressure and the osmotic pressure such that if you have a condition where an individual, for example, is losing proteins, like for example, in patients with nephrotic syndrome, where they lose proteins in their urine or someone who has a chronic liver disease where they have low levels of fibrinogen or low levels of albumin, hypoalbuminemia, then their oncotic pressure is going to reduce. And remember, if the oncotic pressure is going to be reducing, it means that the hydrostatic pressure will now be pushing out more fluids than the vascular space can bring back into the, or the, va the components of the vascular, uh, vasculature can bring back this fluid into the vascular space, such that you're now going to be losing more fluid than you are retaining. So you have this fluid accumulating surrounding these blood vessels, leading to the um, edema, okay, or in this case, the pleural effusion. So it means that things that are going to be messing around with the hydrostatic pressure as well as the oncotic pressure are going to be uh, giving you a transudate. The reason why this is a transudate is because the proteins are not leaking into the interstitium. They're not le leaving the blood vessels. Now, in another case, you may have, uh, remember that these cells here of the blood vessels have what are known as interthelial, um, interendothelial gaps. Now, these interendothelial gaps are small enough such that proteins do not normally leave the blood vessels. Cells do not normally leave the blood vessel. But sometimes if there is an inflammatory process, which I shall give a capital I. If there's an inflammatory process, some cytokines can be released to increase these inter endothelial gaps. You also get recruitment of some uh, white blood cells through this interendothelial gap such that the fluid that is going to be accumulating around this vessel will be very rich in proteins and will have a lot of cells. So you refer to this as an exudate. So this is usually associated with inflammatory conditions, even malignancies. Then a transudate is going to be associated with causes that are going to be causing changes in the hydrostatic pressure as well as the oncotic pressure. So let's get back to this. So you have causes such as heart failure causing transudates, hepatic hydrothorax, you could have hypoalbuminemia, even nephrotic syndrome. Then exudates are usually due to inflammation or lymphatic obstruction. So things like pneumonia or empyema, malignancies, plural, uh, plural TB, uh, pancreatitis, sarcoidosis, and among various rheumatological diseases such as lupus as well as rheumatoid arthritis. Now, moving on to a pseudotumor. So this is just simply a term that's going to be referred to as fluid that's being collected within a fissure. Remember that one of the prominent fissures that you can see on the posterior uh, anterior chest x-ray is your horizontal fissure. So sometimes this fluid can accumulate in this horizontal fissure such that it appears to look like as if it is a mass that is present within the lungs, but it's actually accumulating within the fissure. And most of the times, what is going to lead to you suspecting that this is actually fluid in the in the pleural space is the location where it's usually found in the horizontal fissure. And it's going to give you this smooth lenticular contour. So this looks like a lens. Then moving on to pleural plaques. Remember, these are most commonly due to prior asbestos exposure. So very long ago, they used to make uh, ceiling roofings with asbestos. 
and what they actually realized is that most people that stayed in these homes developed a lot of respiratory issues because uh, this asbestos caused a lot of damage in the respiratory system. So it can lead to thickening as well as deposition of these pleural plaques inside the pleura. So now how are you going to be able to tell that this is a pleural thickening or a pleural plaque is that usually the... The lesion that you see on the x-ray or the artifact, I don't want to call it an artifact, but rather what you're going to be seeing on the x-ray is that you have these uh, pleural thickenings that seem to be superimposed on the ribs and they do not actually seem to be in the lung substance. Then you know that exactly this is a pleural plaque. We shall go into a lot more details of this later on during the course of this review lecture videos. So here are some examples of some diffuse pleural plaque uh, causes. They could be prior infections, it could be prior hemothorax, even some occupational exposures. These are your pneumoconiosis. You could have radiation even some malignancy. So this is an example of a pleural carcinomatosis. These lesions seem to be superimposed on the ribs. And then here is an example of a pleural TB. As you can see, there is even some pleural uh, blunting of the costophrenic angle of the, on the side. So this may be that there may be some pleural thickening. There may even be some uh, pleural fluid that may be associated with this. Then you may sometimes have a pleural-based malignancy, which is obviously very common uh, in metastatic disease, which could be due to hematogenous dissemination or even direct uh, invasion from an adjacent structure. You could also have tumors that are arising from the pleural space, for example, a mesothelioma. So here's an example of a mesothelioma, um, which is was taken in an erect chest x-ray. Now we'll move on to the lung fields. So I won't go into so much details in you being able to differentiate between uh, pathologies that are not going to be found in the alveoli versus pathologies that are going to be found in the interstitium because that is going to be a separate lecture on its own in the next video. So you should be able to check the lungs from the top to the bottom, from the center to the peripheries. You should be able to check for the fissures. Remember that I told you that they are there is the horizontal fissure that's going to be located in the right lung and it's going to be commonly seen on the posterior anterior x-ray but you won't see this in every single patient. This is because sometimes the x-rays can be traveling parallel to the fissure such that it will appear almost invisible on the x-ray. Then the right and the left oblique fissures are not seen on either x-ray views, uh, views. So they're not seen on the PA, they're not seen on the lateral. So the normal fissures, you only see the horizontal fissure, uh, but you don't see it in every single patient. The oblique fissures are usually only seen on lateral x-ray, also not seen routinely in all of the patients. And remember that the oblique fissures are going to be passing upwards and they're going to be passing backwards from just behind the sternum to the fourth dorsal vertebra. The left fissure is going to be actually much more steeper than the right fissure because it begins a little further back from the sternum than the right. So here are the examples of the fissures that I've been telling you about. So here you have your horizontal fissure. You have the first rib, second rib, third rib, fourth rib. So that's your horizontal fissure. This is the right lung with uh, three lobes. You have your oblique fissure, your horizontal fissure, your upper lobe, your lower lobe, and your middle lobe. Then so remember that the middle lobe here, the heart is going to be occupying in this region. So the middle lobe is not really seen on the posterior, uh, the posterior chest a posterior anterior chest x-ray. The only time we ever get to know that there's a pathology in the middle lobe is when we stop visualizing the right side of the heart, something that is referred to as a silhouette sign. So when we see a silhouette sign and we're not able to visualize that, then we know that the problem is within the right lobe or the right middle lobe. Then the left side of the lung is going to be divided into two lobes by a horizontal, by an oblique fissure. That's the upper lobe and the middle lobe. Sometimes you may have an accessory fissure, which is here on the right lobe, which is referred to as the azygous fissure. So here is an example of where the fissures are. So here you have the horizontal fissure, which you may see on your posterior anterior x-ray. So I've drawn it in a dark green line to show you that you can see it on the x-ray. Then the ones that I've drawn in um, dotted lines you can't really see on the x-ray. So you have all this space here being your upper lobe, this space here being your lower lobe, all this here being your upper lobe, this space here being your lower lobe. And then this is the oblique fissures that are, are present on the um, lateral x-rays. So the two fissures are going to be dividing the lungs into um, right... Uh, the right side into three lobes and the left side into two lobes. So here you have your 
right upper lobe, just above the horizontal fissure on the lateral x-ray. That's the position where you have your right upper lobe. Then here you have your right lower lobe. So the back majority of this, you can't really visualize the middle lobe on the posterior chest x-ray because it's going to be hidden by this right side of the heart border. So we only get to see that there's a pathology there when you get um, the silhouette sign or loss of visualization of this right side of the um, heart border. And then on the lateral x-ray, this is the bulk majority of the right lower lobe. Then here is the right or the left upper lobe, which is also going to be covering the majority of the posterior anterior x-ray. You have this on your uh, lateral chest x-ray. Then of course, this is your left lower lobe in that region here. So they kind of overlap with each other because there's a fissure that's right in the middle. And this is the view on your lateral x-ray. So you, you should also check the lung fields uh, to see for any infiltrates or any pathologies that may be present in the lung fields that may be either interstitial or maybe in the alveoli. I will cover more of this in the next review lecture video and we'll give you more details of this. And at the end of these review lecture videos, you, show, you, would, you will notice that actually these videos, these first three videos are actually going to make much more sense when you're done with X-ray week and you would have understood every single thing on X-rays. So the next thing that we move on to is the gastric bubble. So remember that the gastric bubble is usually going to be found on the left side and it's going to be below the diaphragm. And then you should be aware of hiatohenia, which I showed you in the first or the first two uh, review lecture videos. If you missed that, just go back and watch them. And again, I will post a link in the description below with the PowerPoint presentation. So feel free to head, or head over to the link, download the PowerPoint videos and actually read them on your own time. But make sure that you drop a like on this video and you drop a comment to show some support. You may sometimes look for any free air under the diaphragm, but you may be aware of a sign which is known as a Chiladiri sign. I talked of the Chiladiri sign, the other uh, review lecture video. This is just simply a bow of loop between the diaphragm and the liver. You can mistake this for a pneumoperitoneum. Then we'll move now on to the hilum. So we should be able to compare the hilum uh, for the relative size, the density, and the position bilaterally. So remember that we're going to be noting for enlarged lymph nodes. We're going to be looking for calcified uh, nodules. We're going to be looking for masses. And we should also compare the size of the pulmonary blood vessels. So compare the size of the upper and the lower lobes. We should also compare the size of the pulmonary arteries. If they are greater than 1.5 centimeters, then you should think of possible causes that may lead to enlargement of these pulmonary arteries. And of course, don't forget to check for any lines, tubes, or devices. It could be endotracheal tubes. It could be um, nasogastric tubes that may be seen on the x-ray. So remember that the left hilum and the right hilum are not going to be at the same level. The left hilum is going to be lower than the right hilum, about 0.5 to 1.5 centimeter. And please do not confuse the level of the diaphragm with the level of the hilum. Remember that the right diaphragm is higher than the left diaphragm because of the presence of the liver. But the left hilum is going to be lower, or rather, the left hilum is going to be higher than the right hilum. And this should make sense because when we looked at the anatomy of the bronchi, we say that the left bronchi is almost at a horizontal position uh, and is angulated from the trachea, while um, the right bronchi is almost in a vertical position, so it's almost in line with the trachea. So it should make sense that the right hilum should be much lower than the left hilum. And remember that any endotracheal tube that's advanced much further or any aspirated object is obviously going to be ending up in the right uh, main bronchus. So despite them being at different levels, they should have the same density and size. They should have concave borders and they're going to be composed of pulmonary arteries and veins. Normally, you're not supposed to see lymph nodes in the hilum. So it's sometimes you may see some hilar enlargement, which may be caused by many things, some of which include malignancies such as primary lung cancer, lymphomas, metastatic disease from the lung, breast, head and neck, as well as melanomas. You could have infections such as TB, viral infections such as EBV, histoplasmosis, cochidiomycosis, as well as tularemia. You may also have other causes such as sarcoidosis, silicosis, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary aneurysms, or bronchogenic cysts. This may all lead to hilar enlargement. So as we can see here, this is a patient that uh, had um, 
sarcoidosis we can see that there is this mass that you can see obviously in the hyla of this patient and we can see that there's something that is extending over there okay as well as it seems that there is something that's going on over there there's a process that's going on over there and then here we have someone with pulmonary hypertension where there is actually remember that in pulmonary hypertension there's going to be widening or thickening that's going to be seen in the pulmonary um vessels so the pulmonary arteries and even the arteries that are actually going to the hilum here or rather the arteries that are going to the apices seem to be much more dilated and the apices of the lungs seem to be much more vascularized than the lower lung base you refer to that as cephalization so here is enlargement of the right hilum over here and you can see that there's a possible primary tumor that is there so this is a person that had lung cancer with hilar node metastasis so when you when you have a mass that's going to be arising from the hilum and um, this mass is going to obscure the adjacent pulmonary vessels and if the pulmonary vessels are still visible within the mass then the mass is not in the hilum so as long as the mass is in the hilum the pulmonary vessels are not going to be visible if they're still visible, then the mass is not really in the hilum. So you refer to this sign as the hilum overlay sign. So let me show you what I've been talking about. So if we can see from, let me go to a previous x-ray, you're able to see this um, vessels over here. You're able to see the vessels very well. And then now, so this is the bronchi here. Remember the vessels are coming out in that area here and also on the left side here. Then if you now look at this, you're not able to visualize anything much here. Okay, you're not able to visualize anything much here because there's a process that's affecting this hyla. Okay, same thing here. You're not able to visualize any blood vessels here in the hilum. So there's a process that's happening within the hilum. So you refer to this as a hyla overlay sign. Here's a hyla overlay sign. So as you can see here, there's a mass here. So there's this circular aortic aneurysm. We can also see it here, this pouch here. It's here, it's even magnified for you that seems to be obscuring the blood vessels in the hilum then there are some normal uh, paraspinal lines so these are just going to represent the mediastinal pleural reflections so they are obviously only seen when um, they are only seen clearly on the left side where it shows as a thin white line that's going to be parallel to the spine but for now I do not want you to worry so much about these normal paraspinal lines now after you have now done looking at all these aspects of the x-rays your airway your breathing your bones i don't know why i say breathing bones your cardiac shadow or cardiac silhouette and mediastinum your diaphragm your um, effusions and pleura your fields your lung fields your um, gastric bubble and your hilum then there are some areas that you should look at more than once so you should review them so that you make sure that you haven't overlooked anything so you call this as tricky areas or review areas so if the apices you should review them again the mediastinum you should review it again the hilum the retrocardiac as well as the retro the retro diaphragmatic areas and the bones you should look at them more than once so here's a summary of everything that i have been talking about so here is your trachea in the midline so you have your trachea there remember that the trachea here is going to be bifurcating at the carina into the, the main bronchi okay it's going to be bifurcating into the right main bronchus as well as your left main bronchus you have here as your arc of the iota or the aortic knob remember in between the aortic knob and the left pulmonary artery here you have this aortico pulmonary window so this aortic pulmonary window over here then you have your heart in this area your left ventricle most of this and the right side of the heart your gastric bubble here your left diaphragm your right diaphragm over here you have your right pulmonary artery over there you have your right hilum you have the right main bronchus and of course you have this posterior junctional line and of course your trachea so here are uh, anatomy of the normal chest x-ray so the structures that you're going to be having is the trachea, which is, of course, going to be in the midline. So it's going to uh, divide into the right and the left main bronchus. You have your right paratracheal strip, and this is supposed to be strip, not stip. This is a thin line that's going to be on the right margin of the trachea. It may be lost or thickened in the presence of lymphadenopathy. You have your azygous vein, which is just simply a small 
a convex opacity, that, which is going to be seated in the concavity formed by the junction between the trachea and the right main bronchus. Then you have your superior vena cava, which is a straight line that's going to be continuous inferiorly with the right heart border. I will show you all these things on an image very shortly. You have your right heart border, which is formed by the right atrium outlined by the aerated right lobe. So it means that if there's any pathology in the right lobe, you won't be able to visualize this right side of the heart. Then you have your right hilum, which is midway between the diaphragm and the apex of the lung. So it's going to be formed by the right main bronchus as well as the right pulmonary artery and their lo lobar divisions. You have the aortic arc, which is also known as the aortic knuckle. You have the descending aorta, which can be traced downwards from the aortic arc as a line on the left side of the spine. So it's the descending aorta may be obscured by posterior mediastinal masses or pathologies of the left lower lobe. You have your main pulmonary artery, which is just the slight convex line between the aortic arc and the left heart border. You have your left hilum, which is posterior to the main pulmonary artery and extending uh, laterally. So it's formed by the left main bronchus and the left pulmonary artery and their main lobar divisions. You have the left heart border, which is formed by the left ventricle, except in cases where the right ventricle becomes enlarged, you where you actually may have elevation of the cardiac apex, and you may also have your boot-shaped heart. Then you have your left atrial appendage, which lies on the upper left cardiac border. So it's not usually seen unless it's enlarged. So here are the, some of the things that I have been talking about. So here you have this side as your left side, and then this side is your right side. So you have your trachea here, which is a given TR. You have your superior vena cava here, which is and given your SVC, you have your azygous vein, which is this concavity here, your azygous vein there. You have your right hilum, which is this area here. You have your left hilum, which is this area here. You have your right atrium, which is this right side of the heart. You have the aortic arc over there. You have your left hilum, you have your descending aorta, which is on the left side of the vertebral bodies. You have your left ventricle, and then of course you have your stomach over there. Here is another image which is much more detailed, but pretty much showing a similar thing. So you can pause the video at this time. You can zoom into this picture. I've labeled everything on the left and with the labels on the right of your screen. Then on the lateral x-ray, you have your humeral head, which is, of course, some round opacities that are projected over the lung apices. So you should not mistake these for abdominal masses. You have your trachea, which is going to be air-filled air and in the upper chest and the midway between the anterior and posterior chest wall. You have your posterior aspect of the aortic arc, which is just simply this convexity posterior to the trachea. You have the trachea which can be followed inferiorly to the carina, where it's going to divide into the right and the left main bronchus. And you may see this as end on as round uh, lucencies. You may have uh, left main pulmonary arteries, which form an opacity posterior and slightly superior to the carina. You have your uh, right pulmonary arteries, which form an opacity anterior and slightly inferior to the carina. You have a posterior cardiac border formed by the left atrium and superiorly and the left ventricle. Inferiorly, you have your anterior cardiac border, which is going to be formed by the right ventricle, and you have your main pulmonary artery, which is obviously going to be formed by your convex opacity, continuous with the right upper cardiac border. So here are the labels again. Um, over here, you have your trachea, which is labeled TR here. You have your humeral head here, so don't confuse this for a mass. This is just simply the head of the humerus. Then you have your right hilum, which is RH here. You have your left hilum, which is LH over here. You have your left ventricle, uh, your right ventricle rather. You have your left atrium over there. You have your left um, ventricle over there, and you have your inferior vena cava over there. Here's another image which is much more detailed. So take your time to look at this, understand this. They have even have even labeled where the fissures are. Then this will help you understand the lateral x-ray. But I really want you to focus and master how to read an anterior, a posterior anterior chest x-ray. The lateral x-ray, you can learn it along the way and you should also have some functional knowledge and functional anatomy of how it actually looks like. Thank you for spending your time to listen to this review lecture video. If you enjoyed, let's smash the like button. Hit the like button so that you help me out with the YouTube algorithm. Share the page. Drop a comment, show some support, tell a friend to tell a friend that it's X-Ray Week. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevo. We leave no one.